Hi there, my name is Ben Mosier. I run LearnWorthyMapping.com and today I'd like to talk a little bit about evolution in worthy mapping. I got a question recently about how to use the characteristics as you're making a worthy map and how to think about evolution on the worthy map. So let's dive straight into it. Basically, Simon Wardley did a bunch of research into many different publications in order to generalize a theory around how things change under supply and demand competition. And what he found is that generally there's a progression from left to right here, from stage one in Genesis to stage four in commodity. And as things go through those stages, their characteristics and qualities change. So first thing to notice is that this change is happening. It, things are starting out in Genesis where they're you know, unknown, they're uncertain, they're poorly understood, and they fail all the time. And, and the reason that we do anything in Genesis is because there's high potential future value. There might be something worth like learning about or using here. It's, it's the creation of novel and new things. And over time, if those things stick around, there's a bet that we can make, which is basically that as long as there's benefit to be, to be gotten by making something better, someone out there will do it. And so there's this constant force and pressure to evolve or die. And so if the idea sticks around, like long enough, eventually it'll end up in stage four where it's got the exact opposite qualities, where it's totally well understood, it's uh, just completely common and ubiquitous, it's standard, it's just the cost of doing business, and it's extremely low failure, all that fun stuff. So the trick is when we're making our worthy maps, how do you decide where to put something in this spectrum from left to right? And I always tell people to start simple and start easy by just picking one of the characteristics in uh, these four different stages. So for example, failure is my favorite. So it's down here in the bottom. Um, and just asking the thing that you're considering uh, what it's like. And so if I'm thinking of something like web hosting, for example, I'll just put web hosting here. And I can ask myself, is web hosting something where we just assume it's going to fail? where if it fails, it's just disappointing? Or is it a situation where failure is not tolerated? Or is it a situation where failure is surprising? And I think about my experiences with web hosting, and more importantly, I think about the broader world's experience with web hosting. And at this point, I'm gonna make a, an assumption, I'm gonna put my assumption down on paper by pushing this thing into one of these stages. I'm gonna make the assumption that it's in stage four because I am surprised by failure, and I, I generally expect web hosting to always be working. Now, you might disagree. You might see a different situation. You might be having like a custom web hosting situation where failure is disappointing, and then that might be an instance of bias, and that's a whole interesting thing to explore. But just starting with one characteristic, you can already have this kind of conversation. So w maybe next I think about cryptocurrency, for example, and I ask myself, all right, cryptocurrency... Where is it in the spectrum of failure? And I say, well, is failure assumed? Is it disappointing? Is it not tolerated? Or is it surprising? And if I think about this, like the, the folks who aren't already bought into it as like a thing that is going to solve all our problems, um, the folks who are generally more skeptical of it tend to think of it as something where failure is assumed. And potentially there's some value, but like there, it's disappointing in like when things happen, like when... Um, people get rug pulled when people um, end up in a situation where they lose their um, their access to something. Like it seems like that's just disappointing. I mean, it's it's not quite assumed because there's a lot of value there, but it's disappointing. Um, and I'm sure there are folks out there who think that maybe it's it's more failure not tolerated and they're trying trying to constantly get better. But you know, again, this is my assumption. All we're doing is writing down our assumptions about where something is from left to right. Now, the cool thing to do um, when you even do this basic kind of version where you just pick one characteristic and, and, and talk about it this way is if you get multiple perspectives on something and you have some disag disagreement where one person, let's say, thinks cryptocurrency is in stage one and another person thinks it's in stage three or four, well, what that tells you is that maybe we're looking at different parts of that phenomenon. Like maybe I'm thinking of different things when I think of cryptocurrency. Maybe you're thinking of different things when you think of cryptocurrency. And so I might be thinking about maybe uh, NFTs or perhaps uh, like what it, what it, the traceability of funds 
when it comes to uh, like illegal kind of activities and so on. And you might be thinking of the the public uh, sort of ledger version of cryptocurrency where all the transactions are public and that always seems to work. And so you're thinking it's m more evolved. And what that tells us is we need to break the thing down into more specific parts and actually get into the details so we can have a more specific discussion and know that we're talking about different things when I say it's in stage one and, and you say it's in stage three. Well, no there are sub parts that we need to talk about and you're saying it's here and you know what I kind of agree with that and I'm saying that this other thing is over here and we can agree about that or talk about it that's the whole point is, is provoking this discussion where we get our assumptions out onto the table so once you kind of get comfortable with one characteristic and using that um, to decide how evolved something is you can start to use multiple characteristics because the thing is the stage of evolution implies all of them and Simon Wardley has this much bigger cheat sheet in his book, which you can, again, you can go read the book at learnworthymapping.com slash book. And the thing is, each stage implicates all of the characteristics and qualities corresponding to that stage. And you can see there are a lot of them to work with. Ubiquity, certainty, publication types, pr market properties, uh, knowledge management, market, ecosystem perception, etc. User perception, all of this is interesting and fascinating. And the stage implies all of them. And so when you're deciding where to place something, you're reverse engineering the stage by thinking about the qualities first and then trying to fit them into the stage that makes the most sense. So I, the reason I only, I suggest starting with one is just to not get overwhelmed. Because if you show someone a table like this, it's kind of unfair for them to sort of take it all in and, and try to use it. So start with one characteristic or quality, see if you can figure out where it fits based on that, and then as you get more, more skillful, more comfortable using more of these characteristics and qualities, then yeah, use them and start to enhance your, your use of evolution to include more and more of the nuance and details of the situation. If you found this video helpful, well, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to put a link to a learning plan below. Six little steps that I think can help you start to learn worldly mapping. Um, also, feel free to check out learnworldlymapping.com. And let me know if you have any questions. Like, I love answering questions like this. This whole video was prompted by an email someone sent me. So leave questions in the comments, or you can contact us at learnworldlymapping.com. Always happy to hear from you. And I hope that you have a lovely time worldly mapping in the near future. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again soon.